Hi everyone, it's so good to see you. This hall has such a throwback feeling, right? Some of you, if you know, you know, right? This, this hall brings back a lot of warm memories. It's so good to be like within one arm's length from some of you. And I just am really thankful that we got a chance to be in this hall for this month and to just stick put a stake in the ground and just tell the Lord, Lord, we are here to worship you. We are here to be serious about our walk with you. We are here to be serious about relating to one another. So I'm just so glad that you are here with us. And I want to take this opportunity to uh, welcome those of you who are first time, okay, not in this hall, but first time in our church, first time in this next gen service, this young adult service. If you've never seen Hannah before, never seen me before, never seen Diane before, we would love for you to just give us a wave so that I can acknowledge you. Anyone here for the first time? Okay, actually I know got some people new for the first time. I'm going to refer to, uh, can you wave at me? Yeah. Your wave line. Ah, okay. New one. Anyone besides them? Oh, new for the first time? Anyone? Anyone? We want to say hi to you. Okay, if not, right, I just want to uh, echo what Hannah said. Uh, please go and tell your friends that Young Adult Service or Next Gen Service is going to be in this hall for this month and we're going to encounter the Lord together. Amen? Amen. Okay, so uh, it's good that we get to cozy up together uh, to, as a ministry here in Emmaus. This month, we're going to be embarking on the topic of relating to one another, okay? And this particular topic of relating to one another is part of our young adult live stage track. Okay, and so the young people at Eden Hall, they are doing their own thing in their life stage track. And we as young adults, we will be doing our own thing as, uh, uh, in our life stage track. Okay, so uh, as Hannah mentioned just now, for those of you who are attending the Young Adult Summit, in that summit, we will be discussing spiritual friendships. We will be discussing romantic relationships. And we will also be dialoguing over same-sex attraction. All right? And in these services for the month of June in the Next Gen service, we're going to be diving into something that's even closer to us. What happens at home, okay? And how you relate to your family members is an important part of your young adult adulting journey. So we're going to be calling this mini-series Family Dysfunctions. Family Dysfunctions. See, not everyone comes from a dysfunctional family, but if we are honest, most of us here have some kind of family dysfunctions in our family, correct? Maybe you don't call yourself, you don't call your family, or oh, I don't come from a dysfunctional family. I do agree with you, but if all of us are honest, some of us here, we have dysfunctions in our family. And so the particular dysfunctions that we'll be addressing would be absent fathers, and we're going to talk about that today. Uh, the next session, we're going to be talking about helicopter mothers, Okay, and then in the last session, okay, we're going to be talking about sibling rivalry. Okay, how are we going to approach these particular topics? What does the Bible say about them? And so today's title of the sermon is A Fatherless Mess in a Fatherless Nest. The big idea that I have for all of us is this. Neglect and passivity can lead to family dysfunctions and enduring consequences in the future. I say this again, you can take a picture, you can write it down. Neglect and passivity, which are the two topics that we'll talk about, can lead to family dysfunctions and enduring consequences in the future. Now, because we are such a cozy, intimate place now, right? I'm going to get you all involved right from the get-go. So please scan this QR code or you can go to menti.com and use the code 186 I'm going to be asking all of you, please, please take out your phones and scan it, okay? I'm going to be asking all of you to describe your father in a few words. It's all anonymous, so please be as honest as you can. If you need to like hide your handphone away from someone, you can do that. Describe your father in a few words, okay? Visuals team, wait for my cue, and then we will flash the word cloud when there are a bit more responses there, okay? So, key in three words. Try to use one word so that you know we can see word cloud. Five, four, three, two, one. What do Tangling young adults think about their fathers? Let's show the. Wow, wow, this is so cute, right? Okay, so let's take a look at the word cloud that we have here. What's the What's the three most prominent words there? Can anybody read it out to me? 
Loving. Wow, it's so wonderful, right? Loving, hardworking, and caring. Shall we all give a hand to the Lord for hardworking, caring, and loving fathers in Grace Assembly? Wow, we thank God for that, right? Now, I want to just uh, point out some interesting words there as well. Still buying milk. That caught my attention. Okay, the other one that caught my attention is rich. Caught my attention. Okay, now, if we are being honest, shh, weird caught my attention. Stoic caught my attention. Not very present caught my attention. I don't know why mother is there. Okay? Stubborn caught my attention. Emotionless caught my attention. Lazy caught my attention. And so you can see all of us here have different feelings about our fathers, right? All of us here have different feelings about our fathers. And maybe you can relate to some of the words that are over here even if you didn't put the descriptors yourself. Now, I'd like, you, I'd like to show you a few findings from a fatherhood public perception survey conducted by MCCY in 2009 that surveyed 2,000 respondents. 97% of respondents agree that fathers play an important role in their children's lives. 82% agree that fathers strongly influence shaping their children's values. 80% agree that fathers affect their children's uh, general behaviour. And 77% agree that fathers affect their children's psychological health. Now, in a later survey in 2021, the Marriage and Parenthood survey of about 2,800 singles and about 3,000 married Singaporeans between the age of 21 to 45, so that's about your age, too close to my age, okay? They, this is what we found, or this is what the, the survey found, that marriage and parenthood aspirations remain strong, it's wonderful because it tells me that many of you here probably want to get married. Right? I hear a pin drop, you know. You all know that you all might get married to someone else in this room, right? <laughs> Maybe our next sermon series should be on you know, this, this particular topic, right? Now, many married respondents have fewer kids than preferred. So, birth rate dropping. And many believe that fathers are important caregivers who can play a great role at home and be more involved in childcare. Now, what do these two surveys done nationally tell us? It highlights that our relationship with our fathers likely impacted our social, so, psychosocial development. And studies show developing an attachment to our father leads to emotional security and better peer connections as we get older. Now, this is where we land at our sermon. What if, what if our fathers have been absent or distant in our lives? Now, what if we grew up without much emotional attachment to our fathers? What if our fathers have neglected us, were inactive as caregivers in our growing up years, or maybe right now demonstrated passive leadership in the family? What does the Bible say about such fathers? Now, today we will examine the family dysfunctions of a great king, but a not so great father. So let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 13. This father's name is, anybody can guess? David. And I think he really messed up as a father. So I just have two lessons for all of us. Two lessons that we can learn from David's parenting faults. Two lessons we can learn from King David's parenting faults. And if you're ready, let's get into point number one. The first lesson that we can learn is that we should confront unhealthy desires before they escalate. Confront unhealthy desires before they escalate, not confront before unhealthy day desires escalate, okay? <laughs> I realize that it kind of reads like that, huh? And I'm reading from 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 1 to 2, and then verse 6 to 8. So this is what the Word of God reads. You all can see, right? It's big enough? Good. Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, another son, David's son, loved her. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin. And it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. Verse 6, So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. Chao king, okay? 
And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please, let my sister Tamar and come and make a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat from her hand. Awkward. Weird, right? Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go to your brother's Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house where he was lying down. Now, while the Bible doesn't state Amnon's and Tamar's age, historically, Amnon, as David's eldest son, was likely a young adult, someone your age. And Tamar, because she was described as an unmarried virgin, was likely a teenager, someone elevated age downstairs, right? So then you can see that Amnon had an unhealthy, ungodly, and unnatural obsession with his half-sister, Tamar. His love for her. You can see that he loved her, right? This, this, this word is usually used for lovers, not siblings. And this word has sexual connotations. And so Amnon's desperation led him to feign illness to get close to Tamar. Now, we, we read this and we can kind of guess what's about to happen. Then entered David, King David. His father, her father, their, their king, who clearly, as I read this, who clearly seemed oblivious to Amnon's condition and obsession, who clearly didn't sense that Tamar was in a precarious situation. Now, doesn't this tell you how much he actually knew his children? It makes us wonder how much time they actually spent together for David to miss something so obvious. So here's what I suspect. David, for whatever reason, was probably absent in Amnon's developmental years as a growing young man. This suggests that David might have been absent during Amnon's developmental years and that's why his obsession, this unhealthy, ungodly, unnatural obsession for Tamar was enabled, okay? And, 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 and this obsession was able to fester and David's lack of involvement and discernment enabled Amnon and endangered Tamar. His lack of attention to his children's needs and development allowed this situation to fester. So I think it's not far-fetched to say that David's absence as a father and his mismanagement of this situation led to disastrous consequences. It's a classic fatherless mess in a fatherless nest. Now, many of us believe that parents should be vigilant and involved in their children's lives. But not all of us have had vigilant, involved, or present parents. I didn't have them. I don't know how many of you had Parents who were not involved, distant, or even absent. My parents divorced when I was eight years old. And I lived with my father and grandmother, the one, if you all remember from the last sermon, who converted four times, right? I lived with her for a few years. And this picture I found, it, was, it took me a really long time to find this picture because it's a picture of my dad, my mom, and myself. I could barely find photos of the three of us together. The lady at the back was our live-in helper. And when I moved in with my father in those years after the divorce, I, I grew up in a very rough neighborhood. I mixed with the wrong company and I behaved like a delinquent. You must remember I was really young. The divorce happened at eight years old and I was home daily at 11 p.m. Hey, yo. I hung out with gangsters at underground arcades. I watched them take drugs. I stole from my grandma and I was caught shoplifting. All of these things happened before my 11th birthday. Now, I don't fault my father because I think it was a rough time, a very tough time for him as well. He had to work doubly hard to raise my sister and I and his own mother. I know my father tried his best and I don't blame him for being absent. But as a single parent child growing in, a, in such a challenging environment, I really needed a bit more guidance and hands-on parenting from my father. Now what happened was that in P5, when my academics nosedived, 
I moved in with my mother and I went through my entire puberty without the guidance of my father. I'm still waiting for my growth spurt to come. It's coming soon. And I, and I became a Christian at 12 years old and I got serious about Jesus at 14 years old. But growing up in those years, I never understood what it meant to be a man of God. And because of my insecurity, I was constantly in and out of relationships and I made many mistakes with my unchecked and unhealthy desires. I was trapped in an addiction to pornography and ungodly relationship for years, even while I was trying to pursue Christ-likeness. And let me tell you, it was a daily struggle to desire godliness and wrestle with sinfulness on a day-by-day basis. I would have a breakthrough on a weekend and then on Monday, I'm caught in sin again. Now, looking back, it was during those years that I yearned most for someone to speak life into me, someone to confront my wrongdoings, and someone to call out the man of God in me. Now, I really wished, I really wished I grew up with a Christian dad because I think he would have made a difference in my life. But in those years, that yearning for my father was expressed through anger. I was a very angry young person. Have you ever gone through angry years? I'm the only one? I believe some of us have gone through angry years. Thank you for raising your hand. I see that hand. (laughs) You know, that's why I thank God for sending me godly male mentors in Grace Assembly. I cannot imagine what I would have turned out to be if I wasn't a Christian and if I wasn't watched over and guided by godly men. It was in that redemptive journey that God undid a lot of parenting hurts in my life. It was necessary for me to find healing and restoration before I got married and became a father myself when I was 30 years old. I wouldn't wish my kids or anyone go through what I went through, but I wouldn't change anything because it made me who I am today. God willing, according to the survey, many of you might go on to become parents one day. Today, the Bible shows us the severe consequences of neglect and how that neglect has a deep impact on a child. In this case, Amnon. He really messed up. But David allowed Amnon to mess up like that because of years of absence, of neglect, of just negligence. And no one was there to check Amnon's desires that were ungodly, unwholesome. But the question now is, what can we do as young adults if our parents are not vigilant? if our parents are uninvolved or if our parents are absent in our lives, whether now or in the past. Young adults, you have an opportunity to break the cycle of dysfunction in your family. I say that again. Today, you have the opportunity to break the cycle of dysfunction in your family, especially if it's caused by a strained relationship between you and your father. What if I told you today that God has positioned you in your family as a young adult for such a time as this? As someone imaging God in your family, you must speak up if you notice unhealthy behavioral behavioral patterns in your family. It could be in yourself. It could be in your siblings. It could be in your parents and even your grandparents. You can call it out. I have seen one of my friends in school call out his father watching pornography. It can be done. You can stop it. You are positioned in your family for such a time as this. If you've been neglected by an absent father or mother and there are hurts in your life, what are some practical things, practical steps you can take to get healing? My prayer is that we don't bring these hurts and pains into our adult years. Whether, regardless of whether we'll be single, married, or have children. Now, here's a nice thing about being a young adult. As a young adult, you have a certain level, most of you, huh? Most of you have a certain level of awareness. Some of you still still wear blah, blah, right? Most of you will have a certain level of maturity. (laughs) Most of you, okay? And most of you would also have a certain level of agency to do something. Now, my invitation to you is to intervene if you sense that something is not right in your family. 
or even in your own life. My friends, your actions may prevent future disaster. Your actions today, if prompted by the Lord, if enabled by the Lord, may prevent future disaster. Many of you have access to fellow young adults, to spiritual leaders, to trusted mentors. And in Grace Assembly, we also have lay counsellors available for you. So if you know someone who needs help, like an Amnon, or a little bit, half Amnon, M, you know, if you yourself need help, please approach someone appropriate to help you. Don't do life alone. You see, some of us here, like Amnon, we are wrestling with lust and sexual immorality. Or maybe there are some of us here who may know someone in our family wrestling with lust and sexual immorality. My friends, it's time for us to confront those unhealthy desires. Lustful desires left unchecked or unrestrained can lead to deception, sexual immorality, violence, as we will learn later on, and destruction of relationships. Ask God to help you confront ungodly desires both in yourself and in your family members. Don't let this consequence of having an absent parent rob you any further as you continue to mature into single adulthood, marriage, and parenting. I think I've belaboured this point enough. We, the first lesson that we can learn from David's parenting faults is to learn to confront unhealthy desires in our own lives and even with family members. A failure to do so may lead to dysfunction and enduring consequences. Point number two. Point number two. Second lesson we can learn is to resolve conflicts impartially. To speak up and seek help. Resolve conflicts impartially to speak up and to seek help. I'm reading from 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 20 to 22. And her brother Absalom, and this is, um, and this is after uh, Amnon has already taken advantage of Tamar. And her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Now, hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this to heart. So Tamar lived. It's a very sad story, this sentence. So Tamar lived, a desolate woman, in her brother's Absalom's house. When King David heard all these things, he was very angry. But Absalom spoke to Amnon, neither good nor bad. For Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. Now as we look a little closer at 2 Samuel 13, 21, we encounter an interesting variation between the Hebrew Masoretic text and the Greek Septuagint. I'll explain this a little bit. The, Greek, the ESV translation, which is the English version that I've been putting up for you, is a translation of the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew Bible. Okay? And it reads like this. 2 Samuel chapter 2, uh, 13, verse 21. It reads like this. When David heard all these things, he was very angry. However, the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, so they have discoveries from the Dead Sea Scrolls, they add a crucial detail not found in the Masoretic text. The additional words in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 21 are, and you can see in parenthesis, a parenthesis, when King David heard all these things, he was very angry, but he would not punish his son Amnon because he loved him since he was his firstborn. Now, I, I found another version, contemporary English version, that just includes the entire sentence. And it reads like this, When David heard what had happened to Tamar, he was very angry. But Amnon was his oldest son and also his favourite, and David would not do anything to make Amnon unhappy. I don't know about you, but this line, it shows you big time family dysfunctions. On top of just completely missing those cues from Amnon to Tamar, missing the cues of Absalom's anger towards Amnon, now David is enabling Amnon to go away scot-free. No punishment because of his love for him. So this additional phrase gives us insight into David's complex emotions and his struggles with familial loyalty and justice. Though he was enraged at Amnon's sin, David's misguided fatherly favoritism overruled justice. This passage reveals David's failure to address Amnon's crime. 
His failure to act decisively against Amnon's crime set a precedence of injustice within his family. Remember I told you about our big idea? Neglect and passivity has long-term repercussions. And this is exactly what had happened because what David did at the beginning, the middle, and now is got long-term repercussions. So first, David was absent. Now he is inactive. He was inactive in the face of doing what is just and right. You know, Scripture repeatedly calls us to pursue justice and righteousness. If you remember Aaron's sermon, he reminded us about justice and righteousness in Micah 6 8. And we also saw a nation crumbling in our judges' sermon series because the judges didn't do what they were supposed to do. So, by failing to uphold justice for Tamar, David not only made Amnon's sin worse, compounded his sin, but he created an environment that enabled wickedness in his family. Very serious. When Tamar was raped by Amnon, she lived in isolation as a desolate woman in Absalom's house. She was described as being devastated and inconsolable. Who could blame her? You're being violated by your half-brother and your father doesn't do anything about it. Imagine if Tamar was your sister and you spend the next two years watching her deal with the pain and your father doing absolutely nothing to correct the injustice or confront the crime that happened to her. You know, if you all remember earlier on, Absalom told her to chill, right? But if you read between the lines, Absalom was no chill. He, was, he had a prideful and vengeful spirit and he took matters into his own hands. From that moment of David's inaction, Absalom was already plotting the murder of Amnon. He ordered the slaughter of Amnon and people knew that Absalom killed Amnon to revenge Tamar. You all thought Judges was violent, right? In, Kings, or in, in 2 Samuel, it's also very violent. Absalom began his own crusade against David from then on. Remember, long-term repercussions. David's failure in this area shows us the importance of advocating for justice and standing up for what is right. There's a saying, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. You know, I'll never forget how my sister was bullied by the neighborhood gangsters. This bullying took place over a long period of time. Over a period of time, not over a long period. Short period of time. And it came to a head when she was physically held down by the older, bigger girls in the neighborhood. My father wasn't around. He was working very busy. And so my protective instincts as her elder brother went into overdrive. And I remember hearing her scream. I mean, she wasn't so cute when she was screaming, Gaw, right? I remember I was on the 10th floor and I could hear her from the ground floor, Gaw! She screamed. She was in trouble. And I sprinted towards her to confront the older teenage girls. <laughs> she was seven. I was 10. And I was a very scrawny boy. Very scrawny boy. I don't know how the older girls took me. They probably didn't take me very seriously. As I confronted them, I remember being taunted, physically pushed around and threatened. I'm supposed to go and rescue her, right? I reached there. All these things happened to me. I started crying. And I felt so helpless. But I also remember them leaving my sister and I alone for a while. I wasn't a Christian then. And I only knew how to resolve matters instinctively. Now looking back, how I wish my father would have come to our rescue. Or just ask us from time to time, hey, how are y'all doing? How are y'all getting on with your friends? You know, as someone who experienced bullying by other people, not bullying others, right? I'm now extremely sensitive about that with my own children. That is why I want to be the first face they see when I pick them up from school. It's tiring, it's counterproductive, but it's something that I do intentionally because I hope to create a consistently safe space for my children to share their day with me. I'm interested in their big and small things. I want to know everything. As long as they're willing to share, I'm willing to listen. There are good days and there are bad days. There are chatty days and there are silent days. But I'm there for them every day 
if I'm there for them every day, I will know something is not right or when something has gone awry. As their father, I can only do what I can do to protect and guide my children and to be proactive in helping them to cope with difficulties. I desire to demonstrate for them the importance of prayer and bringing our concerns before God no matter its significance. Young adults, if you experience or witness injustice in your family, even if it's caused by someone that is supposed to protect, it is crucial that you seek help from trusted older adults or authorities. Speaking up, speaking out, and standing up for what is right creates a safe home environment for all. I will tell you that you have agency, young adults. You're old enough, you're aware enough, you're mature enough. There's a certain level of voice, volume that you have in your household. I want to encourage you. You see something wrong? Dare to speak up. Stand up for what is right so that your home remains safe for anyone who is in it, including yourself. Unlike David with Amnon, let's ask God to help us resolve conflicts in our family impartially by speaking up and seeking help whenever necessary. And unlike Absalom, who took matters into his own hands, let's learn to speak up and seek help from godly mentors before we stray. So remember, young adults, you are imaging God and you're rep representing God in your family. Whatever you do or don't do lays the foundation for your future homes as an adult. So I repeat this again, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. My friends, let us not let injustice triumph with inaction. The second lesson that we can learn from David's parenting faults is to learn to resolve conflicts impartially by speaking up and seeking help. Inactivity in this area may lead to family dysfunctions and enduring consequences. Allow me now to conclude with Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. This is the concluding verse of the Old Testament and its emphasis on restoring relationships within the family can be directly applied to the narrative in 2 Samuel chapter 13, where the dysfunctions in David's household is evident. So the question now for us, to keep it practical, how can our hearts be turned towards each other? How can our hearts be turned towards our fathers? Young adults, you must remember that it is in God's heart to see the hearts of fathers turn to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. I mentioned just now, you have an opportunity to break the cycle of dysfunction in your family, especially if it's caused by what happened between you and your father. It's a tall order, very tall order, but we can take baby steps to get there. And I want to offer to us just three steps. The first step that you can take, the first baby step, is to recognize your father as a whole person. Recognize your father as a whole person. Most of us think about our fathers in relation to ourselves, but by recognizing that our father was once a boy, a teenager, a young man who fell in love and he had his own life before you came along. Maybe when we start to recognize him as a whole person, we can begin to understand him better. And that will increase our empathy for our fathers when we recognize him as a whole person. The second step that we can take is reconciliation. Now, while reconciliation involves asking for forgiveness from him and being willing to forgive him, there's more to it than just forgiveness. So don't miss this. Reconciliation happens when in your heart you are open to relating to your father again. I say this. Don't miss this. Reconciliation happens when in your heart you are open to relating with your father again. And the third step, the third baby step that we can take is to reconnect and rebuild our relationship with our father. If your father is no longer here on earth, then what about reconnecting and rebuilding a relationship with your mother, your sibling, or your grandparent? Every one of us would have a different path in reconnecting or rebuilding a relationship in the family. And the good news is, God is more than willing to show you the way to get there. But here's the reality of a family 
who's experienced an absent father for years. If you, like me, you have experienced an absent father for years, we cannot turn back time to make it right. Time has passed. It's over. But we can move forward to make things better. We can move forward to make things better. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back if you don't mind. Where I am in life right now is quite interesting. I'm looking back at exactly three decades of not living with my father. I haven't lived with my father since I was around 10 years old. And now my daughter is 10 years old. It's a full circle for me. And God has helped me to forgive my father when I got married. You know, I was really reluctant to invite my father, not because I was angry with him. I had passed the whole daddy issues era, you know. But I didn't want to invite him because he just wasn't involved in my life. I don't have negative feelings about him. I just didn't have much feelings about him. Can, 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 can you all relate to that? Yeah? I just didn't see the need to invite someone who didn't really know me. And so I was like, okay, I'm not going to invite him. And of all people, it was my mother, the woman he divorced, or the woman who divorced him. I don't know how it works, right? It was my mother who insisted that I invited my father. She said, in very classic my mother style, no matter what, Joe, he's your father. Me or Hachu, me or You must invite him. Well, she's not wrong to say that I wouldn't be in this world if not for him. And so, you know what? I wrestled with it for a long time. I felt that since he had been absent for more than two thirds of my life, he didn't deserve to be present at the biggest day of my life yet. I remember struggling with the Lord and asking Him to help me to do what is right in His eyes. I knew what is right in His eyes is to invite my Father. I knew it. I knew it in my heart. I just was wrestling with it, rationalizing with it. You know what? It was really hard for me to describe it. But in that moment, when I surrendered, I experienced this divine pleasure from God, from the heavens. I, I don't know how to describe it. I just knew that... Mm, God is pleased and there was a release there was a surrender and there was victory in my life in the end my father did turn up for the tea ceremony but he didn't come for the church ceremony and the dinner banquet and you know what it was about as good as it got over the last 12 years since I got married neither of us took the initiative to meet up we only got to hang out for a long period of time when my grandmother passed away the one that gave her her life to Jesus four times. And during and, and when, during Chinese New Year, our visitation schedules align. We don't like arrange one another, hey, that you're going, oh, no, I'm not going. We just appear at the same time. If we're there, we're there. If we're not there, it's okay. We, we don't align. But when his birthday came this May, I felt the prompting by the Holy Spirit to ask him out for a meal. He agreed. We met. And let me show you the picture we took together. Every year, I would always be texting my dad a happy birthday message. But as far as I can recall, this was the first time in my life I celebrated his birthday over a meal. He's 68 this year. In that meal, I showed him a recent photo of Eden and Judah. And I told him about their different personalities, their unique interests and their quirks. I told him about how Eden and Judah kept asking about their yeah, yeah, him. And then I asked him, Dad, I said, Pa, are you keen to have meals with us more regularly? I, just, I suggested having lunch together in July and I could tell that he was pleased and he was looking forward to it. We walked back to the car together. I could see that my dad had aged. We said our goodbyes. I was ready to hug him, but I think it's too much commitment. So I, I held back. I just like, you know, the, the guy thing. Hey, ba, the guy. You know, it was a simple, no frills lunch. Just two adults sharing a meal together. This simple meal was 40 years in the making. But my first baby step in rebuilding 
and reconnecting with my Father. I'm not focused on looking back and making things right again. No more. My posture now is to look forward. My heart now is to make things better. I believe that God is just an, as invested as I am to turn my heart to my Father and my Father's heart back to me. One day, my earthly Father will come to know my heavenly Father, perhaps through me or through my children. Young adults, I took my baby step. What is the baby step that you would take today? With all eyes closed, with all heads bowed, Some of us here, we need God's help to confront un unhealthy desires before they escalate. And some of us here need God's help to resolve conflicts impartially by speaking up and seeking help. Today, you're listening to this message and you're asking God for conviction and courage to do something in your family, to do something with your mom or your dad, especially your dad. And you know you can't do the confronting or the resolving on your own strength. And you're saying, Pastor, pray for me. I need God's strength to do what He's calling me to do at home. If that is you, we want to pray with you. I want to acknowledge you. You're raising your hand to the Lord. You're saying, God, help me. Pastor, pray for me. It's tough. I can't do it on my own. But I believe that something needs to be done. And I need God's help to help me do it. If that is you, would you raise your hand to the Lord? Thank you. I see your hand at the side. Thank you. I see your hand at the side. Thank you. I see your hand at the back. I'm going to wait for a while. You know. Thank you. I see your hand in the center here. Thank you. You know that God has already spoken to you about something that you need to do at home with someone or about something and you're finding it tough but you're saying, Pastor, I know I have to do it. May the Holy Spirit empower me, enable me, give me the, the conviction and the courage to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord. If that is you, would you raise your hand to the Lord? Thank you. I see your hand. One last call. Pastor, pray for me. If that is you, would you raise your hand to the Lord? Thank you, I see your hand in the front. Thank you for your honesty. We're going to pray together later at the altar, but I have one more altar call for all of us. Some of you here listening to this message, you want to partner with God to turn your Father's heart to you and your heart to your Father. You know, it could begin with recognizing your Father as a whole person. It could involve reconciling with Him, being willing to relate to Him again. It could mean being willing to forgive Him or asking Him for forgiveness. Ultimately, it is to lead to rebuilding and reconnecting with Him. You know today, listening to God's Word, you need to take a baby step. And you need, you know you definitely need God's help because there are so many different complicated emotions involved your heart is to God may the heart of my father turn back to me and may my heart be turned back to my father if that is you saying pastor pray for me that it may happen in my family without anyone looking around please if that is you would you raise your hand to the Lord you want to get things right with your father thank you I see your hand thank you I see your hand aside. thank you I see your hand my left We are a young adult community here. We are talking about tough matters. Matters very close to our heart. But if we don't address it now, it's going to have long-term repercussions. So today, you want to stick. You want to put a stick in the ground. You're saying, no, Lord. Today, Lord, my heart will turn back to my father. Today, Lord, will my father's heart turn back to me. If that is you, would you raise your hand to 
Thank you, I see your hand. Thank you, I see your hand on the side. Just very quickly lift up your hand. I want to acknowledge you. Thank you, I see your hand on the side. Man. Appreciate it. One last call. That is you. You know that something needs to be done between you and your father today. Would you raise your hand to the Lord? Young adults, shall we all stand in the presence of our God? Our Heavenly Father. Diane is going to lead us in a song. Many of you have raised your hands. Some of you have not raised your hands. It doesn't matter. The altar is open. We want to encourage you to take the next step of coming to the front. We want to pray with you. We want to cry with you. We want to kneel with you. We want to speak life into you. We want to call courage out of you. We want to pray that your heart will turn back to your father. Your father's heart will turn back to you. So as Diane leads us in a song, the altar is open. I want to encourage all of you who know you need to be at the front to come to the front. Let's worship you. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? 